Welcome back. Hope you guys had a good week off. Not too much celebration. I don't know how much Protestant guilt. We have a good crowd tonight, so you guys must have felt guilty. No. No? You didn't ask us how much candy we had. So. How much candy did you have? I'm busted. <laughs> I've got some right here. I started to give these to Doyle and ask him to hide them. Pretend I didn't have these in my pocket. So, um, everybody, I want to welcome everybody online tonight or later when you watch. If you do me a favor and make sure that you comment in the comment section that you're watching, I'd appreciate that. And uh, I'm standing up this evening because um, we're going to do something a little different. We'll do our, our normal prayer ministry, uh, spend a couple minutes, and then... As I told you, we're, we want to talk a little bit about um, our missionaries, um, and we'll, we'll spend a couple minutes on that, and then I want to introduce you to another missionary that's with us this evening. Eric is sitting in the back, Eric Lemke. Um, he and his wife, Yuri, are here. They're both with International Missions, which is our, our normal mission group through uh, the West Virginia Baptist Convention, through the American Baptist Convention. So J.D. and Rhonda... Uh, Sarah McCloy and uh, Myra, you know, who, who we support and work with. Uh, Eric and his wife are part of that same organization. And so, you know, we're locked in for the year already in terms of what we're doing, but uh, this is a great opportunity for you to meet them, meet somebody else in, in this organization and hear about what they have been doing and what they're uh, getting ready to do, just to hear their testimony. I think I, I take advantage of any opportunity we can when these guys are around. Um, first of all, just to hear about what they're doing. Um, secondly, uh, to give you guys an opportunity if you feel called to, to support them. So uh, happy to do that. Happy to have you guys with us. But uh, as we as we get into that, a um, couple things to update you update you on with regard to uh, prayer needs. I'll pull up since we've been gone for a couple of weeks. I want to scan the, the prayer wall as well in case you guys haven't been out there. Um, before I do that, uh, Gary Short stopped by uh, just a little while ago to, to let me know that Jean uh, has been moved to Encompass. And she is in room 226. So if anybody wants to make a note of that. We're live, so I'll respect their privacy. I won't give a lot more information other than that she's there, she's doing better, and uh, she's uh, open to visitation, mainly between 6 and 8 o'clock at night is what he said. would be the best time if anybody wants to reach out and, and see them. Um, Gary's pretty stoked, didn't want a lot of help for himself, but I'm sure if anybody made a little soup or food and took his way, he wouldn't mind that either. So I'll just plant that seed for you. Otherwise, we, we see them and keep tabs on them every, uh, every Tuesday at Romeo's. I also um, had an unspoken prayer request for Cindy Wade and Abby. Um, nothing serious, just some uh, concerns that they have, and, and we'll leave it at that. Let's just cover them with prayer. I'm going to go back to, um, I haven't heard an update on Michael Flanagan um, there's a prayer request. I don't know if anybody in the room has any update. I think it was heart. Heart and kidneys. Heart and kidneys. Do you have any update on? Just what Diane has put on Facebook. She okay. Said that he was. He he did he had his first dialysis and did okay with that. It was like three hours, I think. Okay. And then he's waiting for a room in Cleveland. Okay. But that was he could have it by now because that's been a couple of days ago. Yeah. So. We want to cover uh, Michael and uh, all of the care providers there. Um, Barb had Barb Masters had put on for a few uh, unspoken requests for folks, um, friends of the church, um, and so we want to cover that. I have a prayer request. All it says is Lynn, so I apologize. I don't know who that is, but um, it says for Jerry Stewart who's having surgery uh, April 13th, so tomorrow at Marietta Memorial, and Jack Stewart, unspoken. So I'm thrilled that somebody's, unless somebody, I don't know who that is, if somebody does um, 
maybe you can let me know later, but uh, I apologize. I don't know who it is, but that's cool that somebody's using the prayer wall. So Carrie Welsh asked for uh, prayers for Sue Taylor, and she mentioned to me Sunday also that uh, Paul had some opportunities uh, for, a, for a job interview coming up uh, this week as well. So hopefully that's we want to remember him in prayer. Judy Bonzer, um, Brent Shively's um, had several issues, but she's mentioned that uh, he's back in the hospital again just with some medicine changes and not reacting well to that. So we want to continue to pray for Brent. Um, Bonnie uh, Nestle Road asked for prayers for Barbara Steely with... Uh, Look, it sounded like she wrote both shoulders were broken. Um, and then uh, Charlene Cottrell with a uh, broken hip. So we want to make sure we pray for them. Is Regina here? I don't see Regina. Regina asked for prayers for Herman Lamp uh, at Marietta Memorial. So I'm sorry. He Is that right? Yes. Sorry. I got that right. And then Judy Adams for... Uh, Anita Vanway, Nancy Fetterman, and Tom Brettmeyer um, for different surgeries and, and needs. So that's a lot. I know, you know we've been gone for a, a week, so quite a bit. And so I'll ask around the room, in addition to those needs, if there are any others that anybody wants to mention. We certainly want to lift Eric and Yuri up, but their mission work, we don't want to forget, forget them. Bob, uh, we're waiting on Karen's uh, heart CAT scan test from last Friday. Okay. We went into this thing back a couple months ago, thinking that it was her lungs, and the test worked out that it wasn't her lungs; it was her heart. We finally got that done, and we still haven't heard from him. So hopefully, that's good news. Okay. Well, this still lead to her knee surgery, ultimately, hopefully? Yeah, eventually, but okay. at the moment, we, just, we've totally forgotten about the knee surgery. Yeah, <laughs> just get the other stuff. Yeah. Now, she, uh, her back is giving her a fit, too. She can't, you know, a little bit of a move, misstep, I might, I guess you'd say, uh, something else snaps. And, yeah. Okay, we'll make sure we pray for Karen. Hey, Barb, that was his phone. Oh. <laughs> but I appreciate I appreciate you going to look. Um, yeah. I did. Sorry, Barb. That's okay. Do we have a doorbell? I don't know. We do have one for the kids in the back hall. So for those watching, we just heard a doorbell, and it confused us all. Like Pavlov. It's okay, Phil. Leave, your, leave a $20. <laughs> Leave a $20 bill on the table for interrupting class. I'm just kidding. Uh, Charlie and Regina will be traveling the next two weeks, pretty much. They're leaving tomorrow on a short trip and then a long trip to Hawaii coming up, too. Awesome. They have uh, two weeks they'll be on the road, road or the air. When do they leave? Uh, they're leaving on the short one tomorrow. Okay. They'll be back Sunday for like two days and then they leave again. Fantastic. And Harry's CT scans came out well. Excellent. <laughs> He was happy. That's a praise. Yeah. And I had put a Nicholas on there, Nicholas Davis. He's related to um, Bevan Ron Somerville. Okay. He uh, fell from a roof and broke all those ribs. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, he is able to sit up in a chair now. He's still not allowed to walk. Wow. Uh, he, went to, he had his three-month checkup down at the doctor in Charleston. He said he could sit in a chair for short periods, and that's all. It's going to be a long recovery. Yeah. That was a big fall, Carrie. Um, I have um, two friends. It's it's her and her husband. Um, she had been in, um, in a bed because of some leg issues that she's been having. She's been in a hospital bed for three weeks, and her husband just had triple bypass. Mm -hmm. So they are just kind of down for count from the perspective of just need our prayers for just healing and Perseverance. First names or? Deanna and Carl. Deanna and Carl. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Becky? I'm one of four children in my family. I'm the oldest, actually. <laughs> and my, uh, my sister that's just a little bit younger than I am has Parkinson's and has been on hospice and not gotten out of bed for this will be the third week coming up. Um, she, needs, she needs lots of prayer. What's her name, Becky? Sherry. Sherry. Mm -hmm. And then my brother, Randy, is, has passed out twice and not had a heartbeat. And they traced it to a lack of iron because he's had a lot of issues with acid reflux. And they've taken out a lot of his stomach, and he doesn't have enough stomach to process enough iron. Wow. So he's, he's, he's younger, younger than I am, but he's going to be on iron infusions for the rest of his life now, it looks like. Wow. And my baby sister, Judy, just had <laughs> her second uh, knee surgery. She's, she's going to be fine, but we feel like we're the only two in the family that are still strong. <laughs> So, anyway. Everybody stay away from Becky this week. <laughs> right. You don't want to be related to me. Let's just right. say that. Anybody else? Around the room? All right. Let's 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 pray. Lots of, lots of needs tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another glorious day, another chance to be together and uh, spend some time in uh, fellowship, Lord, and... Uh, and communion, learning about you. Uh, Lord, so many prayer concerns and needs lifted up to you this evening. And um, we just ask that you would supply the needs of each person. Lord, you know what they are. You know best what they need. That you would bring them the care and attention that they need. That you would move us and the people around them in such a way to provide that, to provide the love and support, the encouragement that they need, uh, to be a reflection, Lord, of your love. Lord, I pray that you be with all of the care providers in each of these situations, Lord, that, that uh, you'd be present with them, that you would lead them, guide them uh, as they're working to solve problems and provide good care, Lord, that, uh, again, that... that uh, the infirmed, the infirmed would know uh, your presence through them. Lord, I pray for travel mercies for those who are traveling. I pray for intercession, Lord, for those who just need you to step in in some way uh, in situations in their life that are beyond their control and just protect them, build a, a wall of protection around them, Lord, and just... Um, Keep them safe. Lord, the important part is that we know you're in control. We know that with you in our hearts, Lord, that we're not victims, that we're victors. And we know that the sufferings of this life are temporary compared to the glory that's eternal with you. So, Lord, we just, we're so thankful for that. We're just a few days past celebration, your celebrating your resurrection. I'm just so grateful for that willing sacrifice and what it means in the face of uh, any of these afflictions. Lord, just the hope and the peace that we gain from knowing you. So, Lord, we are grateful. We are humble. And we give all of these problems to you. So, Lord, now be with us as we receive these guests. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to their testimony and to their message. And we give all these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this time, um, is you, so Yuri's with Harper. Yeah. Do you need me to go babysit? We've got to work it out. Okay, because um, I know that she's going to want to come up and share also. Yeah. But um, So I'll introduce this as Eric Linke. So I'll let you explain, but this is how I met Eric. I'll, I'll thank Bob. Because you left your steno pad at the at the annual training day, so this is how God works. Bob left his steno pad at the annual training day, through doctors' visits and this and that. It took me over a month to get back down there and pick it up. And the day I went in and picked it up, I looked over and there was this absolutely gorgeous RV for sale, 
which I know I can't afford, but it was still worth looking at. It belongs to this fine gentleman who's standing next to me. And I start, you know, Frank Miller acted like he was going to get a commission or something if he <laughs> sold it for you. And he gives me all of Eric's information to get in touch with him. And so I leave, I get your book back to you, and then a few days later Eric called to talk about not only the RV, but to tell me about himself and everything that they were doing. And it was just a perfect opportunity for God to say, hey, you know what? Why don't you guys come up and talk to us and let us know what's going on. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm going to speak first, and then I'll switch spaces with uh, places with my wife, and she'll come and she'll share her calling and testimony. Uh, this presentation we're going to give you is usually what we give on a Sunday morning, uh, filling in for a sermon time. So I'll try to go quick so you can hear her story. It's much more interesting than what I have to say, uh, and you'll find out why. Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin, and I grew up in the American Baptist Church in Green Bay. And in my journey in life, as we're going to take a journey through uh, what's been going on, i uh, I found my way down to a school in Oklahoma uh, as a second degree. Uh, I had already had a bachelor's degree in graphic design and photography, but I felt this call to go back and study Christian ministry, uh, and this opportunity was presented to do that. Uh, so I made my way down to this school called Bacon College. It was originally founded by the American Baptist there for Native American education. Uh, so I prepared myself going into this new place to learn about Native American culture because we don't teach about that very well in our education systems, right? Uh, but when I got there, I, I lived down in the dorm, even though I was in my 30s, uh, and in this dorm were 30 refugees from a country I'd never heard of, uh, Myanmar or Burma. And over the first year that I was there, developing friendships and relationships with these these refugees uh, we were on a scholarship called the learning work community so we would study and learn together we would work by traveling to churches as a praise team and presenting to churches about the school and then in community we lived together and we ate together uh, toward the end of the year uh, it, it was really the stories of one particular ethnic group out of Myanmar, the Karin people, the Karin story that I heard that touched my heart. And I could hear God saying, help the Karin people. But I thought I was going to school to study for being a youth pastor or going to camping ministry because that's, that's where my parents were. They were the caretakers of our summer camp in Wisconsin. Uh, but this help the Karin people kept resounding in my head. Uh, and so I think about the end of November, I, I, I prayed the most honest prayer and I said, Lord, I, I will help the Korean people, but I can't do it alone. Uh, send me a helpmate to be a bridge between the Korean people and myself. And then the next semester in January, this young lady shows up on campus, uh, a young Korean lady, uh, and we quickly became friends. Uh, I finished school before she did, uh, and we got married on the campus. Here's our wedding day. We bought a house in Muskogee, Oklahoma, close to the school, and you can see where we had both graduated from school. So that's my, my quick calling story. Help the current people. That's what God laid on my heart. So we started this journey together, um, and she's usually here, and it's kind of helpful when she's here, uh, but it's okay. The first step in our, our sending agency is International Ministries through the American Baptist Churches, USA. Uh, the first step is to go to Hear the Call, and we did that. It was held in Green Lake, uh, Green Lake, Wisconsin, where the National Assembly grounds are for American Baptist. And it was a weekend of time spending with other missionaries, learning about the process and finding out Yes, we actually would qualify to, if we applied, that, that we would qualify to be missionaries. Uh, it was a, a great weekend, followed by the, uh, a, a week-long World Mission Conference after that, a lot of worship and things. We had a, a good time of discernment together. Uh, it was July of 2018. 
as Yuri was finishing her senior capstone in, in ministry, uh, she the capstone project is you identify a ministry that you see yourself involved in the future. So since we had gone to hear the call, Yuri decided, hey, I want to do I want to bring aid to a specific refugee camp in the Karin state in, in Burma. I'm going to say Burma instead of Myanmar. It's the same country, right? It's the old term, Burma. Uh, so she raised money uh, over the first semester. It was a January term. And then we went there in May of 2019 together. And uh, she then finished out her writing aspect in the summer of 19 uh, following her graduation. This is her trip that she took there. We went uh, by truck and then by boat up the river. And we got to the last checkpoint and the, the Thai authority said, I was too white to go across to the other side. So I had to stay in Thailand, but my wife was able to complete her project by going over on the other side. Uh, she brought pillowcase dresses from a women's group in Oklahoma. Here she met in one of the churches. Uh, this is the Etuta refugee camp leader, the pastor and his nephew this kind of an interesting this church that's there uh is now supporting this this young man to go to ministry school so a church in a refugee camp supporting one of their own to go into ministry his his hope and desire is to come back to this camp and, and be a church leader uh yuri did another trip later in the year where she brought uh, games and, and prizes and things for the day uh, and spent a, a full long day with them uh, bringing things like noodles and uh, oil and um, some uh, candies and things but her main project that she did in May she raised enough support this is, these are sacks of rice back here I'm not sure if you can see these on the screen um, but uh, she was able to buy 120 or I think it was 115 sacks of rice which would feed the entire 3,000 people in that refugee camp for two months. They had never received uh, aid like that from a couple. It was always from organizations. Uh, so this was a great first step. Uh, Yuri stepping into a missions, uh, foreign missions, uh, and us working together on it. But it's mainly her project. And I'm glad she's in the room now. And Harper's back there sleeping, so... <laughs> So after that trip, we decided, uh, Yuri's stipulation was we have to wait until she finishes graduation. And then we can apply to, uh, to be global servants, if that's what we were feeling that we were going to do. So we did. We applied after that summer. She had finished school, and it took a year for this process uh, of application. Uh, which led to our the August 2020 is when we were officially endorsed. Uh, to be endorsed through international ministries, you have to have a, a few things in line. And the main one is a ministry partner in the country of service, an invitation to come and work alongside them. So we have a ministry partner along the border in Thailand that is inviting us to come and work with them. And I'll talk more about them in a little bit here. Uh, moving in the timeline a little bit down the line, we heard news that the Burmese military was bombing close to the Atuta refugee camp that Yuri had been at. And on one day, all 3,000 refugees crossed the river into Thailand. Now, during COVID times, Thailand did not let them in. They did not let them go and resettle in the refugee camps. They were basically told, go back across the river. Uh, but this was pictures from that day of, of all the, the, the people living in that Atuta refugee camp, 3,000 people. February of 2021, maybe you saw this in the news. It's a little bit old news now, but there was a military coup. Uh, the country had, I'm talking about Burma now, Myanmar, uh, they had democratic elections where the people voted for a new leader. They voted in Aung San Suu Kyi um, and didn't last long. The military said it was voter fraud and put her in jail where she remains in jail today. And the military continues to run the country. 
One of the things that the military likes to do in the uh, rural areas on the outskirts of the country is they like to do airstrikes, like I talked about at Tuta. This probably was a house at one time that was bombed, and this one the, uh, was taken of a church that was hit with an airstrike. So where do refugees live? Well, if they can't live in a refugee camp in their, their own country, they hide in caves. And when you're living in a cave, you don't have very much for as far as supplies, healthcare, food, you don't have none of that. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. But one thing that the Karen people have as a priority is education for their children. So these are, this is a wonderful picture <laughs> I had found. Uh, these are students studying in the jungle. They don't have a classroom, they don't have desks, but they have a desire to learn no matter where they are. So here they are learning and here this group is studying a little bit, even if they have little ones to take care of. In August 23rd of 2021, we welcomed the addition to our family, Harper. Uh, Tanapo is a Karin middle name, which means little harp or a small stringed instrument. So she's sleeping, but maybe you'll get to see her after. So our, we met our first milestone uh, in November of 21 which was 25% of our fundraising goal. And that means that we were able to be appointed. Uh, I was able to leave my full-time job that I was working so that we could be full-time in our efforts of fundraising, going to churches and presenting and talking like we are today. So one of the things we did, we took our house and we put it up for sale. And we moved uh, all of our stuff and uh, the family up to my parents' place in Wisconsin that we home base out of. <coughs> in the beginning of the year, <coughs> we identified that traveling in a pickup truck with an infant, a newborn, it's not a good idea. <laughs> it's a lot of things to move. So we invested from the sale of our house in our motorhome, which... Pastor Troy had mentioned uh, that we do have it up for sale now. And if anybody would like to buy Pastor Troy our motor home, he would much appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I remembered. I threw it in there. Okay. <laughs> and we have our car too. But we took this motor home all over. And this next photo shows where we went. Starting, uh, we, we picked it up in Wisconsin and drove back to Kansas um, we traveled all, these are all church names, so I know you can't quite read them, but there are 45 churches and gatherings that we went to just last year. Uh, somewhere in the middle there, uh, we had a couple weeks of where we all had COVID. Well, that was not a fun time. Uh, but that brought us all the way <coughs> through the end of November. And because of that thing we mentioned, COVID, we weren't able to do our vision trip. A vision trip is something that a newly endorsed global servant would do within the first three months. They would go visit with their ministry partner, see where they're gonna be living, where they might go to language school, and obviously where you would be serving. And we didn't get to do that. We waited until January, the first week in January. Uh, we actually left in December and visited Yuri's family that's over there in Thailand and then had our vision trip. <coughs> we made our way to where we're going to be serving. This is not a very good map of Thailand. It's hard to really tell what it is, but Bangkok is the big city that most people know of down in the south. And way up here, about eight hours through the mountains, <coughs> is the May Sot area. And there are four educational places that we see ourselves serving. Our ministry partner has invited us to be a part of these, and they're listed here. So this was from our vision trip. This lady here is our wonderful area coordinator for Southeast Asia and Japan. She's the one that introduced us to our ministry partner. On the week end that we were there, 
Um, on Friday, we got to meet with the leaders of the, uh, the, the border area. Uh, Dr. Sawa Do is our main contact. And we planned out the, the weekend. Saturday, we planned to visit two places. This was the first one. Kathule Hope Theological Seminary is located south of Mesot. It's uh, a brand new building uh, that was finished, I believe, just last year. It's a great resource for library, classrooms. And this is a view looking at Burma. That's their view toward Burma. Very, very close to the border. Uh, but it is in Thailand. Currently, they have about 35 students on, on ground there. They also have students online all over the world. So there's a good chance that we'll be tied into here, uh, maybe teaching some classes or tutoring. Um, I have a technology background, so they're excited about that, helping the staff and helping with, uh, like I helped them build their website a year and a half ago. Uh, just little little steps that way. So this is one place that we'll be at. In the same location right next to it is a learning center called the Thumaki Learning Center. And there's a thousand migrant kids from, from Myanmar that are living there residentially. A thousand. That's not a typo. A thousand kids. <coughs> it's a, a really nice facility uh, that uh, has a lot of classrooms. One of the neat things was that I met this teacher, young guy, uh, engineer. He uh, took me to a, they have about a two-year program in engineering there. It's not accredited or anything, but they're teaching these, like, it's a K through 12 plus for the age range. So it's kind of an associate's type level. Um, he opened the door into the classroom, and it looked like my office from my last job. It had 3D printers and um, you know, projects being built and things. Uh, very exciting for me. I can see working alongside this, this young man in helping. Uh, he was really interested in, in real life uh, problems that the students could tackle. Uh, so this is a, a good spot where I feel that I could step in and help, and, um, help them a lot. They only have about 40 teachers there. It's not very many for a thousand kids. Any, any educators in the, in the group? 40,000 students, that's, that's a lot. On Sunday, we got to go to a Korean church. And of course, when you go, it's customary to have the guests sit at the front of the, the church. So we sat at the front and they had food afterwards. And the pastor, this is the pastor here, he took us over to Hillite Theological Seminary which is in the same little town, again, south of Mesot. This is their view of, of the border. <coughs> They've been there a little bit longer um, and have around 40 students that, that live there. My throat is really dry today, I apologize. This last place is the place that we talked about the most over the last two and a half years because we thought 100% of our time we were going to be at this one location. This is the Cthulhu Korean Baptist Bible School and College. It's located in the Mela refugee camp. Mela is the largest of the nine refugee camps in Thailand. There are somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 people living in that refugee camp. This school itself, they just had graduation, but last semester they had 450 students all studying ministry. How amazing is that? Amazing. They have three different tracks. The one that everybody wants to get into is the English Bachelor Level of Theology, uh, which is accredited. Uh, if they don't make the English requirement, they do a certificate program in the Korean language, and they have a third one also, and I always forget what the third one was, my apology. They have about 70 faculty and staff. We got to meet with the pre-students. These are all try they're studying English, trying to get into that upper level class. We had the chance to, uh, our area coordinator taught them a song in English. It was a lot of good fun, but 
we talked so much about this this school because we didn't know much about the other locations and what our involvement might be. Our invite is to teach classes here. Um, I can see tutoring, and Yuri will talk more about what she's feeling called into doing at this place. Our main contact is not at the school anymore. He's still connected to it, but we basically reintroduced ourselves to some of the leadership that's at the school, and they have invited us also, again, to come and teach, <coughs> especially when we said that we don't cost anything to them. We, we bring aid with us. Uh, they were very excited after Yuri spent maybe a half hour speaking in, in her language to them and getting them to understand that they don't have to pay us, uh, that we are there to help them. So that's enough for me. I'm going to let Yuri come on up and share a little bit more. And hopefully you guys are thinking about questions. That was a lot to share. Uh, but enjoy what Yuri has to Hi, hello everyone. <laughs> Glad to be here and exciting to share about um, my calling and the ministry. Um, I want to share a little bit about myself. I went to Bacon College to study um, in 2015. My plan is I actually enroll in business major, but when I get to Bacon College during my first semester, I found myself spending a lot of time around Christian students that, that study Christian ministry or study Christian program. And so I um, involved in ministry on campus, like, you know, um, sometimes we do praise music, we'll join and then we'll sing, we worship together. I also play some guitar, not professional, but some guitar and I can sing. So I really enjoy um, uh, involved in ministry on campus and I feel like during that first semester my sp spiritually is growing and I'm more connected with God and I start to realize that is wow this is amazing I feel I feel that is God is doing something in my heart so after talking to Eric during that time we were still friends so I talked to him, I said, what is Christian ministry? You know, what is really is. I kind of know that people that is going to ministry you know, <laughs> study, you know, they study to um, serve the Lord, maybe be a preacher or pastor. And I said to myself, wow, I, I don't think I can preach. I don't think I can, you know, be a pastor. That's not for me. Ministry is not for me. I, I don't think so. But when I talked to Eric, after I talked to Eric and Eric said, well, ministry is you know, um, if you feel like God is calling you to serve and you want to help people, I said, wow, I, I like to help people. You know, I always want to help people and want to do, make a difference in others because, you know, um, so he said, wow, you mean, you think that I can, <laughs> maybe, you know, I, maybe if that what you want to do, you feel like God is working in your heart, you know, so. I think a little bit, I went back to my dorm and think about, you know, hmm, then I, I think about changing my major, you know, like, should I change my major from business degree to Christian ministry? And I, it's so frightened for me because uh, um, I, in my mind, what, in the past, what I think, think about Christian ministry, you have to be a preacher, a pastor, like, Oh, I can barely speak in front of people. I'm not a public speaker. How am I going to share about the gospel and, you know, the Bible to people? I don't think I can do that. It's a little bit frightened, but a lot of people, you know, in, and then I, I, since uh, some of the students are studying Christian counseling program and, you know, emphasis in Christian uh, counseling, uh, Eric said, if you want to help people, you know, you can, you can take that uh, counseling classes. You can help counseling people, you know, and the people that it, that's a that can be a ministry. It's not you don't have to always to preach. I'm like, oh, that's great, you know. <laughs> so after that, my first semester, I decide to change my major from Christian uh, from business degree to Christian ministry, emphasis in Christian counseling. And how well before that, when I came. 
here in US in 2012, I didn't speak English like this. When I went to Bacon College, I'm still, you know, learning English and process through all the things, you know, about life in school, in college, and the language, English, so hard. And I have to work really hard in order to pass each classes. So it's a lot, but um, I want to share about myself a little bit. I, I'm a former refugee, came from Karen refugee camp, one of the ninth refugee camp located along Myanmar and Thailand border. I lived and grew up in refugee camp total of 17 years before I came to, uh, came to US. Um, and why my family and many other Karen refugees end up in refugee camps, the story, the um happened many years ago even like you know seven decades over seven decades ago it's always military coup always power struggle in myanmar and um myanmar is a country of um, diversity and different ethnic groups that live in different parts of the country um, um Karen ethnic group is one of the ethnic group that live in the um the eastern side of myanmar so um when the military coup happened, when I was very little, I was about four years old, um, the Burmese military you know, came into Karen State and start killing people, civilians, and burn their houses down. So, I killed a lot of people. So, I'm sorry, bear with me a little bit. Every time I share about this, I get emotional because it's the, the things that, you know, the Burmese military is still killing people and still attacking not just the Korean ethnic group, but also other ethnic groups in the northern ethnic group like Chin Kachin and other Rakhine or other ethnic Karani and so many. It, even the people that live in the city right now, you know, they will, the, the Burmese military really took control of the country and everybody else that not live under them want, don't want to live under um, military dictatorship they just go and persecute them so when i was four years old um, we've been forced to leave our village so many villages and many families we gather and we just have to f fled to the jungle because it's, it's too dangerous we cannot stay you know in our villages and the Burmese mother just keep coming and keep coming and start killing people. And if they saw you, if they see people in the rice field, they just kill them there. If they come into the village, they start attacking and shooting and burn the houses down. So we, uh, we can't stay in our home. So we have to flee. And we can't take anything with us, of course. Back then, even until today, we don't have road or transportation that we can you know, put our things in the truck and go. We, we just take whatever we can and we just, we fled and we have to walk through the jungle heading toward Thailand, um, toward Thailand, toward the border. That was the safer place for us to go. So um, while we are running and hiding in the jungle, the news came that we cannot return. You know, we have to keep moving toward the border. That's a safer place and too dangerous to return. The Burmese military or military already destroyed the houses. And then there's no way that you can go back and save. It's too dangerous for us. So that's why um, many refugee camps um, set up along the uh, Myanmar and Thailand border, total of nine refugee camps. And my family and I and many refugees um, um, some of them is still remain in the refugee camp and I live in refugee camp and grew up there for 17 years until 2006 um, the opportunity come that is refugees can apply and be settled to other countries like Canada, America, Australia and some country in Europe so that was very excited. I, I live in refugee camp for so long. I grew up in the camp. You know, education is very limited. Food also very scarce and very scarce. Not a lot of food. 
food that they give us to us. I'm sorry if I speak certain word that is not correct. That I'm still learning English, so um, forgive me. <laughs> um, bear with me, please. So, um, you know, the food that they give is to refugees. It's not enough. Some months we don't have any rice left. We, you know, we eat a lot of rice almost every single meal. Just like here, people eat bread and other type of food. So um, sometimes we have to be careful how much we eat because the food that they give us is sometimes it's not enough. And if you, we eat too much and we might not have the next day, you know, for to eat. So we just have to, it is struggling every day. Um, um, education is very limited and also freedom. We don't have freedom to go outside of the refugee camp because we don't have any identity, we don't have any paperwork, any status, we just have refugee status, that's it. So um, it's almost like we are the people of no land, no country, even though we have home, we have our own country, we have our own land, but our home is too dangerous to go back. So. Um, we end up many refugees still live there. So it's a struggling, struggling refugee camp, not enough food, uh, it, no freedom. If Think about if you live in this town and you are not allowed to go outside, you can only live in here, where you're gonna work, where you're gonna get food, how you're gonna take in care of your family. You know, just because in refugee camp, it's just a setup for refugees to temporarily just live there until they can return home because it's been so many years that the current state is still conflicts going on and the village is just gone just abandoned and you know uh, took over by the um, the jungle so it just all the villages is gone when um, the and another reason that is it's too dangerous to go back is when the Burmese military came into the villages, they bury landmines around the villages, so uh, we cannot go back. If you go back, you can step on landmine, and then, you know, you can lose your life, your legs, and your eyesight, which is a lot of refugees that people that they want to return home. They just left the camp and cross the border, go home, and then what happened? They step on landmines and they never make it out alive. So it's too dangerous for us to return home. So um, in 2006, my family, I, I, pers my, I personally, I want my, my family, my dad to apply, to resettle to America. I don't know, I don't care about other country, but I dream about going to America because when I watched those movie, you know, Hollywood's movie, and there are so many children that they are riding on a yellow bus and going to school and have a lot of food and ice cream. That's what I'm dreaming, that I want to go to America. That's why I, you know, um, really beg my father, ask my father to apply so that we can go to America. But, you know, at my father age, that generation, they still have hope that it's Sunday they can go home. They miss their home. He was born there. He grew up there. And he wants to return home. He said, ma'am, no, I don't know. Maybe not, you know. And I just keep said, let's apply. See, everybody go. Because some refugees I came, they call their family back. You say, because of, you know, the language and everything is not like in the camp. So it's... it's creating fear from the refugees that remain in the camp. Fear and the unknown uncertainty, you know, if they resettle to America, what's going to happen to them? It's all about fear and, you know, and so my, my father just not apply. And then in 2007, and I just telling him, you know, you need to apply, I want to go. What you're gonna do here, you know that you cannot return home because you don't have a home anymore, Dad. Look at the reality, you know. I just like keep encouraging him, but finally he listened. And I prayed to God that is, he will, you know, open up the door and the way, make it happen for us so that we can resettle to America. And, um, and then finally in 2007, we applied together and to resettle to America. And then my hope is like, 
um, the process would take about one year, two years the most, and we'll be in America already, you know. But um, for my family, the process uh, took a total of five years. Since 2007, we applied and we followed through the process. We're doing all kinds, follow the process, everything. And I thought, why it is, it took us so long. Why so long? I just prayed, that, why God? Why you don't make it happen for my family? It's, you know, other family apply and they just go. But why not my family? And I met a God and I, I feel like God is not listening to me. I, I said, you know, God is so silent and God is, I said, well, when you ask, God will answer you, right? When you knock, when you seek, you'll find God. But I look at the scripture and I said, it doesn't work, you know, this is, what, where, where are you, God? I'm asked God during that five years. But I remember in 2012 and we received the, um, the letter that came to our house. And then said that we have a date, we have to get ready to go to America. And I was so happy and so excited. And at the same time, I feel, I feel like, you know, God is not really abandoning us. God is not really um, forget about us. He, even though he's not, you know, he's silent, but he's still working. And then he, you know, and I remember the scripture again. I said that if you knock, when you ask, when you seek, you'll find you, the door will open. And I, I remember that scripture, you know, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry, God, you know, I, you are so faithful. And I, I just like so happy and mixed emotionals, you know, when we receive that letter and then we have a date and so we have to go and pack up. We don't have much things, you know, and we don't have a lot of things in the camp. We pack whatever we can, only our backpack and little carry-on bag. And in um, February of 2012, we arrived in America. The last, uh, the, our destination is Huron, South Dakota. And we arrive in Huron, South Dakota in bitter cold <laughs> winter time in February. And we arrive at that little airport in Huron, South Dakota. And at night, 10, 10 o'clock at night, and I step out of the little plane, and I can see a big pile of white snow. And I like, is that a snow like in the movie? You know, and, and I, it just so cold, and we're so tired from the trip. You know, we just just want to uh, rest and sleep. That's what the the story of coming here. Um, Yes, um, if many, if you people and family, you know, ask, ask me that why you want to go back to Thailand and why you want to go work with the refugees, why you want to work um, along Myanmar, Thailand border, it's so dangerous. There's nothing for you to do there. It is you better stay here and work here, you know, start your life here. And, you know, I said, well, actually, I don't. I don't want to go back, you know, because this is, this is the place, this is the country that I always want to come. I always want to have a better life, have freedom and education, and I can do something that I, you know, I want to do, and I can help people here with my counseling degree with, in ministry. Um, but after we went to um, hear the call, World Mission Conference in um, Green Lake, Wisconsin, if you heard of that, um, you know, we talk about what God is really calling us, you know, as a family to do, what God is calling us to do. And we talked to uh, Leslie Turley, and maybe you can work, if you want to help the refugees, you can go to Thailand and work with the refugees in refugee camps. And I look at them, I'm like, huh, refugee camp? That's where, that's where I'm from. I don't want to go back there. I love America here. You know, I want to work here. And... I, it took me after that if, um, the conference and hear the call conference everything went back to Oklahoma and it took me two years to make decision to accept God's calling 
and then sometimes I look, I look at to the sky. Say, God, are you, are you joking? You know, I asked you to send me here in America, and now after ten years, you're calling me to go back. I'm like, that's not what I want to do. That's not in my plan. Again, God is changed my plan again. It's calling me to go back, and you know, when God is calling you, your heart change. You know, it's the things that you don't want to do. You think that the things that you can't do, the place that you don't want to go, but God is always calling you, come, come, you know, and God is just calling you. Your heart is like, okay, God. And then I I say, yes, why not? It's, you know, even though that's what I want, I want to help people. Going back to Thailand, it's not like I have to go live in refugee camp again. It's not like I don't have freedom. I became U.S. citizen already. I have freedom to travel and I, you know, um, follow my dream, going to college. That's what I always want to go, want to do. And then I, I um, um, pursue my dream and I accomplish my dream. And then it's time for me. This Going back, it's, it will be a totally different kind of experience because going back is to go and help the refugees that because I I form a refugee so I know how difficult to live in refugee camp I know how much that is difficult when you have to live in fear and when you have to flee from your home that you don't have a home and you don't have freedom to travel you don't have enough food you can't you know go to school and education is very limited so I want to go back and share this experience and knowledge and all the education that I learned here in, in America here. And I want to go back and work with the school because cause I see the importance of education. And most of all, you know, to go back and share the gospel to the Korean people that are still lost, still hiding in the jungle, still live in the camp that is, you know, so hopelessness place that I can go back and share the gospel and share about the love of Jesus Christ that God it has not abandoned them. God is still love them dearly. You know, we can have hope in Christ, even whatever, whatever we are facing and whatever the difficulty in our life. And I accept that, you know, God's calling and I say, yes, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to go back and, you know, work with the refugees, which is the, along the border, Myanmar and Thailand is so much need there, which is, we visit the last time, um, they need teachers, which is perfect. You know, we, we can do that. We can help them through education. We can make a difference that way as well. And we spend a lot of time with refugees and travel along Myanmar and Thailand border as well to ministering to the people that are fleeing from their home. Thank you so much everyone for giving us opportunity to come here and share about, you know, a little bit of my testimony and how God is working in our life and what God is calling us together to serve him and serve others. Thank you. So I got a couple more pictures for you guys. <clears throat> You know, it was the story, you know, Yuri shared about the Korean people fleeing. It was one of the students at, at, the, at the college that we're at. Uh, when I heard his story of fleeing with his uncle and seeing, turning around and seeing his uncle shot in the head. And that's where he laid and was buried. He, no one could turn around and save him and, you know, bury his body. They had to flee. There was just no, no chance to take care of him. Uh, it's just heartbreaking stories. Uh, and so much trauma that has happened to to these people uh, that it's amazing that we uh, as as Baptist West West Virginia Baptist Convention right uh, are sending one of their own back that has been trained to help deal with that trauma. I think it's it's really a special uh, full circle. You know, Yuri's going back to a place she never wanted to go to. But as she said, when God calls, your heart changes, you know, and you, you answer that call. Um, here's uh, Mela Refugee Camp. Um, you see the houses that are there. It's built of usually a refugee camp. Uh, I always thought of them as like tent cities set up in the desert because it's usually in the the Arab kind of countries, but here they build them out of bamboo and leaf roofs and things. Um, again, there's 30,000 to 50,000 living in Mela. I'm not really sure the, the number, but it's a lot. 
and you can see how close the houses are. They're basically built right on top of each other. They're built into the hillside anywhere they can. It's about a three mile stretch and it's stuck between a highway and the mountain. So you can't go much wider. You can't go up the mountain too high. Um, and only three miles long. Uh, in our journey, we, uh, we today have actually hit this 80% is when we can schedule our commissioning service uh, and we're getting ready hopefully we're planning for May 21st in Kansas City at our our sending church there um, haven't updated that because we're sitting at about 99 percent we're not quite to the hundred although it rounds up so uh, it's taken a long time to get to this uh, it's uh, been a, 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 a journey, you know. <laughs> uh, Yuri talks about journey in five years of waiting after applying. Here it's taken us about two and a half years uh, to get to this point. Um, so at a hundred percent, they're they'll be getting ready to do a, a vote for us. Uh, hopefully next month, we still have our startup costs that we need to raise. And ongoing support is what that 100% uh, for our, our whole budget uh, for the year. Uh, still looking for commitments in, in uh, supporting financially. But before I say that, I should say we want to ask you to do two things with us. Um, the, uh, the first one is not just financial. It's going to be prayer. I love that you started this, this evening with prayer. So we have prayer warriors here. We ask you to join us in prayer in three different ways. The first way is to pray for our family, our, our family of three as we travel. We travel a lot. Uh, Harper is growing uh, and, and running everywhere now. Uh, and soon she'll be talking, although she's sleeping now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> hardly know she's here, right? Uh, but pray for our family because it, it is a lot. Uh, to be on the road all the time um, and answering a call to uh, to go to the place you don't want to return to. Um, secondly, we ask that you pray for our ministry partners, uh, the schools that are training that next generation of Christian leaders that are going to go out along the border and into the current state to, to be leaders in their communities. As missionaries, we help develop the next generation of people because a person from their own culture is going to reach people from their culture the best. Can we agree with that? That's the, the new missionary style. It wasn't always that way. Uh, so here you have Yuri. She's Karin. She's going to be able to reach the Karin people much better than I can. And again, she was the answer to that prayer that I had, right? So pray for our ministry partners, the school, the teachers, and the students, especially as those that just graduated are going out. They are going out into places that are very dangerous, full of landmines uh, and potential bombings. And uh, pray for them. The third one is, of course, the situation in, in Myanmar itself, the political situation. We really had hope in uh, 2021 when they had the election. It looked like democracy was going to return to the country. Uh, we just keep praying that God will move in the hearts of the political leaders, that change, real change can occur. Because it would be great to have our ministry not be working in Thailand, but actually working in the Karen state where the Karen are from. That would be such a blessing. Uh, but we're not there, so we need to pray for that political situation. So that's the prayer warrior side. The other side, and, and our ask for you personally, is to consider joining just a dollar a day. Uh, when I was little, I remember hearing this. Join a dollar a day and feed the children in Africa, right? A dollar a day does a huge amount of work. Huge amount of work. Um... We're getting very close, like you said, to that 100%, but every dollar helps. It helps put two teachers 
on the border to help train, again, the next generation of Christian leaders among the Korean people. Um, we have a table display back there that has some of the Korean weaving material. It's a big part of their culture uh, to do weaving. So Yuri makes bags um, out of out of them as they're, they're sitting over there. There's also side bags that we have. Um, and you can talk with Yuri after. Uh, if you're interested in, in joining our, our ministry, uh, even in prayer, you can take one of our, our cards and fill out the back side so that we can get your information and put you on our mailing list uh, or email list, that sort of thing. And if financial, this is the easiest way, is to call and say you, that you met the Lemkes and you'd like to support, support us. Uh, we thank you for having us, giving us the time to share, giving Yuri the time to share her testimony. Do you have any questions for, for Yuri or myself? In this part of the country, what do the people think about Jesus? In, in, in the border. In the border. So Thailand itself and Myanmar are Buddhist as a whole. But the Karin people were reached through Adoniram Judson. Do you know that name? Right? The work of Judson. He went to uh, Yangon, and when he was there, he reached the Karin people. They were very receptive. There's a really neat story uh, in the uh, oral stories from the Karin people that talked about a white brother bringing the book of life to them. And so when Judson came with the Bible, our book of life, they were very receptive. Uh, so there's a mix with the Karin people between Christian, Buddhism, and animism. Yeah, yeah a lot of different influences there. It's <laughs> a good question. Yeah, we're just after seven, so I'm not Perfect. sure how long you usually go. But well, we'll stick around. I know nobody too, wants so. to do choir practice tonight. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm. I just appreciate it. It's, it's always interesting to hear um, any missionary story that we hear, but such a compelling one. Um, and I, I, I won't try to add anything to it. Um, I just want to. We've. You know, when we think of Myra and when we think of JD and Rhonda, we think of, um, you know, you, uh, Eric was talking about the time it takes to get com fully commissioned and, and go, you know, Sharon, we were just talking about um, Sarah McCloy, that it, it took almost a year and a half, we're approaching two years for her. Um, so it's a long process. And so, Certainly anything that you guys are willing to do or feel called or led to do would be a tremendous help to them uh, in their mission. Um, I think it was Sarah when she was here from Matthew 9, 37, 38, and I know a lot of missionaries uh, know this verse well, but we say the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Um, so pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so we pray for that, and here they are. So thank you, and thank you for sharing your testimony. And I, Eric said it, but what an amazing opportunity, uh, Yuri, that you have to do something that, in a way that nobody else can do, to, to go back to that place that you came from and, and, and bring God back to them in a way that, that nobody else could do it. It's just that simple. So what a blessing, and praise you, uh, bless you for answering that call. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll wrap up. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to, to meet Eric and, and Yuri and Harper. Lord, and I just, I pray that you'll be with them as a family on their mission, that you would uh, work on the hearts of, of the people they meet and speak to, um, to provide for them 
everything that they need uh, to be faithful to you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will be with the people who they've been called to serve. And I pray for the situation that they're uh, going into. Lord, as there's, it, it cannot be over, uh, it can't be ex over exaggerated how dangerous a situation that they're in. So, Lord, I just pray protection around them uh, as they set out on this journey. Lord, we thank you for um, perspective. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to gain some perspective on the blessings that we have and the things that we think are difficult in our day-to-day -day life, Lord. Um, I pray that this would serve as a reminder for us uh, just how blessed we are and how much work there is for us to do. Lord, I love you, we love you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Guys, thank you. Make sure you visit with them and, and check out the table. Yes, Bible study. Thank you, Patty. The Thursday Bible study, uh, before you guys jump off, and for you, the menu is cheesy onion roll-ups, um, vegetable beef soup, and they're going to do dinner rolls, and I was told on good authority that dinner rolls are coming from Bob Evans. So that alone might draw you in. And then there's going to be cupcakes and lemon fruit salad. So, Thank you. All right. So it should be another great Thursday luncheon. So we hope to see everybody there. Guys, good night. Thank you for coming.